We're going to change tack from business very much now to, to a community-based uh, part of our agenda. There's more community later on. And um, I am delighted um, to have met this next uh, guest of mine. We met a few months ago um, when we started working together on the local outbreak board. Um, Helen Atkinson is the Director of uh, Public Health for Portland City Council. She is leading uh, the public health response to COVID-19 pandemic. Prior to this role, Helen was the Director of uh, Population Health and Wellbeing in Frimley. Uh, and uh, before that, she's had a succession of jobs in that community and, uh, and care service. She's worked in South East and East London, and as I said, has held down many roles. So Helen, Welcome uh, to the Shaping Conference, and I'm sorry we're not standing together uh, two metres apart or otherwise on a stage in the Guildhall, but it's great to have you as part of our conference this year, and welcome. Thank you, Steph, and I think it's all credit to uh, you and uh, Shaping Portsmouth that you've managed to successfully deliver a very, very safe conference today. Thank you. We, we, knowing you were coming on, we wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> so, Helen, let me start by a, a rather, rather sort of tongue in cheek question with a slight smile on my face. When did you start your role as the Portsmouth you know, Director of Public Health? Well, Steph, I actually joined Portsmouth in at the beginning of February last year, 2020 and uh, was very excited about joining Portsmouth because uh, I'd heard, uh, worked across the region and heard so much positive uh, messages about working in Portsmouth, particularly because of the strong relationships across the sector. So it's not just great integrated working across health and care, which is no doubt is in place, but also across all of the partnerships in Portsmouth, including business, the university, the naval base. So I was really excited about coming to Portsmouth, but uh, hit the ground. And within three weeks, we were in the uh, major incident mode in terms of the local resilience forum for the pandemic. And obviously, my life pretty much 24 hour seven has become pandemic. Luckily, I did train as a consultant in health protection. So it is my background. But I also love doing what I would call general public health work, which I'm still doing. But I have to be honest, most of the work has been uh, around pandemic during this time. Indeed. Uh, and I I'm grateful to you for making the time today because I know you've got an, an awful lot of things you're juggling with. Um, we will talk about um, COVID second. But the first question, really, what are, what are you, what do you see as your main priorities for 2021 as far as public health in the city goes? Well, obviously, and I will leave um, um, the pandemic for the next section, but clearly, I think uh, what the COVID coronavirus pandemic has really shown across the last year is how important it is to reduce inequalities. So what we have seen is uh, greater inequalities in terms of mental health, emotional well-being, health. Um, but uh, inequality is also impacting on what I would call the wider determinants of health, which are really my passion. And I think that's why it's so important that um, we, um, you know, the launch today of the Imagine Portsmouth is so important because actually it really, for me, focuses on what really impacts on people's health and well-being. So it's my responsibility to, to improve the health and well-being outcomes of the population of Portsmouth. And when we tend to talk about that, people tend to focus on the NHS and health services, which of course are critical to uh, people's outcomes. But if I tell you that we, there's a lot of research that shows that the, what really impacts on people's health and well-being is actually everything we're talking about in the Imagine Portsmouth um, strategy because it's not health and care is really crucial but that becomes crucial when you've already become unwell or have a need for care so in terms of people's overall health and uh, emotional well-being outcomes it's actually only 20 percent what really impacts on people's outcomes are the environment that's built and also uh, natural environments by about 20 percent but then also when you look across it you know and public health are well known for being what we call the um the the uh, lifestyle police so you know we obviously encourage and support people to 
lead an active lifestyle, both for physical and mental health. A, um, obviously encourage people to drink sensibly, uh, not to smoke, <laughs> all of those things. But you know they are important because they also have a huge role in terms of people's health outcomes and by about another um, 30%. But also we know the importance of the employment. So actually having a job is probably the most important thing uh, that you can do for your health and well-being, particularly if it is a, a job where you are being you know, reasonably paid, that you're feeling that you've got control of your life. Um, those are important, as well as housing. And of course, can't not mention education. Education plays such a significant role in terms of our health and well-being. So those are always you know, the priorities for us in public health, how we work because we can't obviously in public health deliver all of those. It's about working with our partners across Portsmouth. So obviously you being one of them and um, shaping Portsmouth to actually try to improve people's li uh, life outcomes. So those are the real priorities. But I think what pandemic is, that the pandemic has shown us, as it has in previous, if we look back in history, you know, pandemics happen. This isn't unusual. Luckily, they don't happen too often. And I think we also need to think about uh, the preventing further pandemics, because actually I think what we have seen is what we used to call one in a hundred year uh, situations now are happening more regularly because of our lifestyle, how we travel, how we you know produce food, all of those are huge factors. And, and obviously thinking about, I know Councillor Steve Pitt mentioned climate change. These are all factors that will impact on our lifestyle. So what we're trying to do is ensure that we're reducing the likelihood and we do obviously that work uh, nationally regionally and locally but uh, I think what it's shown us is that we've actually increased inequalities over the last year and so those that often do less well have done worse and we know that through you know uh, education children that haven't been able to be in education um, are more impacted if they are in perhaps more deprived communities. So all of these are factors that we, you know, we prioritise in terms of uh, how we work through our partners um, across the city. So those are the priorities that I would really like to focus on as we go into 2021. We've got a lot to do, I'm afraid. And, and you know you can count on our support to help you every step of the way. So the, the elephant in the room, Helen, we know is COVID-19. Um, just either from your own personal or professional or organisational point of view, what do you see as the main risks to our city, you know, uh, recovering from it for, for the city's population point of view? So, so firstly, I would like to start actually on a more positive in that we, we really want to thank um, both businesses uh, but also obviously our residents who have been, you know, working incredibly hard to be around COVID, what we call safety compliance. Um, I still think there's a lot of media attention around non-compliance and actually not so much on what I would call compliance. So we know there was a, an ONS study, uh, which was it, it, an ONS study that was published on the 7th of January which actually showed that, and this is a national study, so it's not Portsmouth related, but there will be obviously people in Portsmouth who feel this, that actually 88% um, of people understand and support lockdown um, currently. Um, and I think that's really important because we tend to, in the media sometimes, not always see the positives. But I suppose my main concern, uh, and I think the highest risk is, is what I like to call COVID weariness. We are all, exhausted and tired of this pandemic you know I think it's really been um, you know it's been so it's a year now actually it was a year this week that we saw our first cases in the UK and had our first death in the UK from pandemic so last year obviously started early but lockdown was at the end of the mar a March we had you know three months of lockdown through actually some I would say better weather. So um, I I think people really managed it well uh, in very difficult times. We then obviously went back in with hope into a summer period when the infection rate came down. 
and then obviously started heading into the autumn which is always our difficult time in winter with viruses we had the further months lockdown in uh, october uh, sorry november actually and then obviously if, uh, october november then have hit winter now obviously also i think the disappointing news has been in the uk with the new uk variant which i hear today now is in over uh, 50 other countries now because the trouble the the well the trouble is with a virus is it spreads very very quickly um even with the compliance we still know that the virus does spread uh particularly obviously person to person and particularly in households we have seen a new variant now of in fact there's uh interestingly there are actually often new variants in viruses and actually there were many at the beginning of last year but this new this new uh, uk variant is a lot more infectious and so what we have seen is uh, a s significant impact in terms of our infection rates in Portsmouth locally regionally nationally and um, that has had a huge impact on the NHS uh, we are still seeing um, real pressures in the NHS locally and regionally even though we are now I'm glad to say to say today that we are seeing a reduced or a reduction in the infection rate in Portsmouth so today as of today our rate per 100,000 population is at about 443 which is is still really high and I do want to stress that we are still seeing very high community spread of the virus but that is a reduction of 23 percent in the last seven days so that is good news and I do want us to have I mean this has been a really up Beat, really positive conference and I don't want to be the person that brings that conversation down however it is important to note that we still have got a high infection rate and of a variant that spreads very very quickly so I suppose it all goes into that you know that real weariness you know we are we were told this week by the Prime Minister, of course, that uh, the route to uh, coming out of lockdown would be announced on the 22nd of February. And obviously, I'm also aware, um, uh, my, my uh, children are grown up, but I'm also aware of the impact that the fact that schools are not open for all children. Obviously, they are still open for our most vulnerable children and children of key workers. But, you know, I do recognise the huge impact that schools not being completely open is having both on our residents and also on business because ultimately you know business who have been incredibly flexible and willing to be adaptive are having to adapt around the needs of their employees at this time so it's a really important point and um, so that weariness is there for all of us I mean I'm sure you know I have a very tired team I am um, I, I look at my colleagues across the council you know who are also very tired and I look across my colleagues in other sectors we work very closely with the university with the naval base with yourselves obviously with our health colleagues and we've got a lot of very very tired people and when people are tired it's more difficult to I suppose keep going even though we have got this shred of light and I suppose the next point being vaccines. So I can't not mention the vaccination programme, which is really important. And let's be honest, the vaccination programme is our road uh, out of um, this particular pandemic. Although, um, so really it's important. I suppose the next risk is that we, you know, we do get vaccine hesitancy. Although I would like to say that I'm not seeing that at the moment. Um, we, I know people are frustrated because the information isn't coming out quick enough and people are desperate to get their vaccination. But just to be on, you know, just to give you some of the information, we will have, and I think that Tristan men mentioned it, we will have the St. James's vaccination, mass vaccination site opening next week, which is a huge um, positive for Portsmouth. We've already got a uh, significant vaccination happening in the QA for patients and staff. And the QA has also vaccinated our, our care workers, so our care staff as well, which has been great. And we've had now for a few weeks the local GP um, vaccination sites up and running. And I don't yet, which is also very frustrating for me, have data 
of vaccination uptake for Portsmouth residents, but we know across the whole region in the southeast, we've now vaccinated a million people. I say we, that's, that's taking the credit from the NHS. The NHS have vaccinated a million people. Um, but, you know, just even supporting the vaccination program, there are many volunteers um, from, you know, from public services, but also other public, non-public health services, lots of people helping support that program. And we've had so far, uh, we've had, uh, I think it's actually at 200, nearly, if not just over 250,000 people have been vaccinated across Hampshire and Isle of Wight. Now, clearly, that's great, considering the first vaccination wasn't actually even given until the end of December, and we're not at the end of January yet. And I know people are, in, you know, impatient and keen, but it is pretty impressive for a national vaccination program and what will continue to happen is that will increase so we are expecting to have the group cohorts one to four vaccinated by mid-february and majority of the first pro uh, party um, cohorts by the spring uh, i say the spring i don't want to give a date because things move but that is pretty significant which could mean that we could have as much of the population vaccinated by you know by the summer would be great i mean obviously this does rely on having vaccine and obviously it does take time to uh, produce and develop vaccine so i still want to say what a huge achievement it has been for the country so i would say the greatest risks are probably those two yeah okay and and helen for me uh, you know, as you know, sort of someone who is a very big, you know, sort of supporter of taking the vaccine. I know we, we've got other movements that aren't. Is there any difference in your professional opinion between the AstraZeneca or the BioNTech or the Moderna ones? Is there any any big differences between the three of them? Uh, no, they are all uh, effect effective. And, and as you can imagine, I do get quite a lot of emails with quite a lot of varied um uh, personal views around vaccination. I can tell you that vaccination in itself is probably one of the most effective public health interventions that we've ever had, um, uh, you know, in, in the world. And so we're really lucky that we have got already three vaccinations that are uh, through the, the, and it is a very rigorous program, uh, program of check, you know, of research development and checking to see if they are safe but also be effective. And we know that all three vaccines are effective in, um, man in, you know, in preventing or creating immune response to this virus. And that's really important. I know that they all have slightly different efficacy in terms of their percentage, but I think the main thing that we need to recognize is that all of the vaccines that are being used in this country, and we are very lucky to have three vaccines approved already, are effective in, um, in basically creating that immune response so what we know is it will do is that even if because we do know that some people have or since being had then their first vaccination have then contracted um coronavirus but we know that it has a huge impact in terms of the reducing the seriousness of that illness and all of this is as we know really to uh to save lives and and obviously to protect the NHS. What we're trying to do with vaccination is obviously create immunity in the whole population, but it is to reduce the impact of illness and save lives, which is really important. So I would worry less because people won't get that much choice. Where they get invited will be which vaccine they get and all are effective. So I would encourage everybody not to worry too much about which one's best, but to actually just if offered vaccine, go and get it. I uh, really encourage all of you. I certainly will be when I get offered. Uh, yeah, I'm tier five, I think, so I certainly will. So, um, but Helen, let's finish on a bit of a high. We've talked about a city vision, imagine Portsmouth. Uh, you've seen the sort of pillars that go around there. Um, what, what's your vision for the next, say, three to five years about public health in the city? What would you like to see as the step changes made? Well, obviously, my, uh, I think I, I answered some of this earlier, but so my overarching priority is to improve the uh, life, um, well, the, I would say actually life expectancy and 
healthy life expectancy of our residents. And that means throughout life, I don't just mean that people live longer, I mean people have full and active lives from birth till they die, uh, which is you know really important, and that we have good quality of life throughout. So for me, it is really going back to those really important factors. And I think now we are going to have an even bigger job that I thought than I thought we had when obviously I started in February last year ahead of the pandemic. So we've got more to do. And for me, it's about it's how we do that all in that partnership, because not one part of our um, of our uh, partnership across Portsmouth can do it alone. We have to do it together. So one of the things I would like to encourage, and I think it is already happening hugely, but we obviously have quite a lot to do now in terms of employment and business development in terms, particularly I'd like us to focus on those that have probably been most impacted over the last year. So we know that young people, you know, I, I, I often think that this is really difficult for all of us. I mean, I'm struggling as much as everybody else is, but I really think that the impact of this virus on young people's lives has been a huge impact. So there, you know, we're currently employing some, some of the students from the university uh, who were training in our contact tracing service, and we'll be also uh, hopefully employing some um, in our testing centers, and as well as other young people. We really need to uh, give our young people an opportunity. So I encourage all of you to think about your, your focus in terms of as we come out of this pandemic and can start to develop our businesses further. And I think um, not to lose some of what I think has been really innovative. So even though it's been a horrible year for all of us, there has been some innovation, I think. I mean, I think we've heard it this morning through all of the speakers. You know, we are going to, I think, change how we work, be more flexible, use digital more. So how can we think about those people that have struggled the most? So that is our young people. It's perhaps some of our women who have got child care responsibilities. And it's definitely those that I would say in some of our more deprived communities. So how can we really focus that development? And also for me, um, we really have to rethink um, mental health and emotional well-being. This isn't about just specialist services. It's about how we can all um, work to improve uh, our own mental health and emotional well-being and our employees and our whole population. So I think I'm, I'm aware, Steph, that you've been working with um, um, Gordon um, and Claire from the Mental Health Alliance. And we're really, I think, focusing much wider now. And there's lots of opportunities for training online for businesses around how they can support their employers around mental health, uh, the um, five ways to improve mental health. So I think all of those offers, and I would not be allowed not to mention because I have one of the most passionate members of my team leads on the Make Every Contact Counts program. So which I know we'll also want to bring out to the city, to employers. So it's really thinking about how we as business, as in, uh, employers can improve the health of of the population, both in terms of local employment strategies. But we know there's really good evidence that we know that those um, organizations, those businesses who really focus on the health outcomes of their employees can actually, uh, so almost plan in health and well-being to the business day. So how can we encourage our employees to be active, eat more healthily, you know, reduce alcohol you know all of those boring things that I mentioned earlier that public health love to focus on and it's not about not having fun or not doing anything you enjoy it's just about you know how you balance and measure and what I've been really excited to see is how many people have been more active I mean it's just amazing if you go out now I know you know businesses are struggling in terms of you know not being able to you know um, have people in doors in terms of you know um eating drinking shopping but what's been great is how active people have been and there was such a significant impact last year in the first um the first wave and our first lockdown on increased people cycling walking using our green and blue space in the city but also what we saw is in the huge improvement on air quality uh, so I just want to mention that one thing, because it's so important that we do improve the air quality, which is one of my big priorities, along with um, 
I know the council, well, with Councillor Steve Pitt and uh, the council leader as well. So, you know, those are some of the things that would be great for us to work on in partnership to actually really improve those, you know, those outcomes for our residents and which has a great impact then on business, I would say in um, Portsmouth, you have reduced sickness absent levels and you have um, increased people, you know, using the different services that are delivered by all of the business in Portsmouth. So I'll end there because I clearly have nearly used all my time up. No, it's fine. Uh, Helen, you, you know how much I enjoy working with you. You're, you're an absolute credit to your profession. Um, you're a brilliant leader of your team. And we're lucky to have you in the city. We hope to keep you for many, many, many years. And as you say, we're out of time now. And I look forward to working with you and the team. You've mentioned Claire and Gordon there on the Mental Health Alliance. Um, and we will be, we'll be focusing on that in March and April. And uh, I just want to thank you for taking this time out of your busy day. And you've, you've, done, you've done something brilliant for me. You've mentioned together. You've mentioned partnerships. So two of my three key words of today, you've got them in. So thank you. And then thank you very much indeed. And uh, if, if you're around later, you can see what, what I'll uh, tell the team we're up to this coming year. But thank you once again for now. Thank you for having me. Thank okay. you. OK. Um, thank you very much indeed. A fascinating lady, brilliant individual and a great leader of her organisation in our city.